Men. Uh, morning, church. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Katie. Um, how about we read God's amazing word together now? We're reading from Luke chapter 11, verses 17 to 28. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. Beelzebul. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armour in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with you is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds a house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. This is the word of our Lord. Um, now, unfortunately, David is unwell, um, but thanks to technology, we still get to hear from him today. So please turn your eyes to the screen uh, as he speaks to us. Hi. Uh, unfortunately, Marianne and I caught COVID this week, so we can't be with you today. Um, and it's a double whammy for us because not only can we not be at church, but... Uh, our grandson was born this week on Friday morning uh, to Wesley and Alex. Moses Rietfeldt is his name. Uh, he's down in Victoria. We can't go see him yet. Um, and probably we'll be there next weekend visiting him when we're uh, out of our lockdown. Um, so uh, great news for us as a family. But unfortunately, you have to watch on the screen this morning. Anyway, we're uh, continuing our series in discipleship. And Matt will, you'll remember, launch this series uh, where he talked about how disciples don't look back. Jesus has a potential recruit, someone who comes to him and says, I'll follow you. And Jesus says, oh, if you're going to follow me, foxes might have holes, birds might have nests, but the Son of Man has low, no place to lay his head. If you're going to follow me, you can't hang around. Um, you've got to... Um, let the dead bury the bed dead. You've got to put your hand to the plow and not look back. There's a single-mindedness about Jesus. He doesn't have earthly roots, but he's focused on the kingdom. He's focused on going towards his destiny, which is the cross, the resurrection, and then being at his father's side. And for those of us who are disciples of Jesus, we need to have that same single-mindedness as we follow Jesus. So that was the first week. The second week... We looked at disciples serve their neighbours and uh, we read about the Good Samaritan. Um, you might think that the priest and the Levite would be good examples of discipleship, but actually they kind of use the law to avoid their responsibilities to their neighbour. And it's the Samaritan who would be despised by the Jew, who slows down and stops in a way that is risky to himself. And he extends himself in the way that he cares for this half-dead Jew. Uh, and his care is, is radically generous. Um, and so he goes to the Jewish innkeeper and says, here's some money, and if it costs even more, I'll come back and I'll pay. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. You want to be someone who loves your neighbor? You want to be a disciple of Jesus? Then we need to be... Uh, 
radically generous. We need to be risky. We need to extend ourselves as we go out into the world and care for others. That was the second week. In the third week, we looked at how disciples go. So Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Uh, you're going out as sheep among wolves. You're going out with empty purses. And so cumulatively, the picture there is that we will feel like there's too much to do. There's not enough people to do it. We're weak, we're vulnerable, we're amongst wolves, we don't have the resources we need, and so we're going to be prayerfully dependent people as we go. Going is not, oh, I've got a plan, I've got a strategy, I've got resources, uh, I've got all my ducks lined up, now I can go. No, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a risky, uh, it's a God-dependent, it's a non-self-reliant journey to go, and as you go, you grow. That was the third week. Um, and that is a great segue to the fourth week where Nathan spoke about prayer. And did you notice that Jesus is not teaching his disciples to pray for themselves? Oh, you know, I'm feeling sick or um, I've got this uh, issue at work or some financial troubles. Or No, the disciples are praying about the kingdom, that the kingdom would come here on earth as it comes in heaven. Uh, and they're prayerfully dependent because they're feeling stretched. They're feeling like they don't have the resources or the capacity within themselves or enough people. And so they're praying that God would bring his kingdom. And they are, are praying for themselves a little bit. It's for their daily needs. Uh, I don't know about you. I look at my superannuation balance and I kind of do some sums and I work out, well, I have enough till I'm 80 or 90 or and Jesus says, just pray about today. Uh, that's all you need. Uh, think of Israel in the desert. They go and collect enough manna just for one day. And so there's this continuous prayerful dependence. Um, and we even need to pray in such a way that uh, we're embarrassing. We, we look shameless. Um, we, uh, God is generous. It's, it's not a question of God needing to be uh, manipulated, have his arm twisted so that he'll give to us. God's a good God who's better than our earthly fathers and knows how to give. But we need to ask in a way that reminds ourselves that it's not because of us and our resources and our capacity that we can build this kingdom. It's because we're asking the Father and he is building the kingdom, right? That's kind of the point. And then there's a line about leading us not into temptation. So uh, Satan is at work and he's tempting. He's tempting Peter um, and he's tempting all disciples. And so Jesus teaches us to pray against succumbing to temptation, which is a great segue to today. Disciples encounter opposition. Not only is discipleship going to be challenging, it's going to be hard, it's going to be stretching, it's going to be beyond us, so we're going to be prayerfully dependent upon the Father, but actually, to compound things, make them worse, we're going to encounter opposition. And so, we read today, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. And when the demon left, the man who had been mute and also blind in Matthew's Gospel, but we don't read that here in Luke. Um, uh, the crowd was amazed. But Jesus said to them, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving... Sorry. But some of them said regarding Jesus, he's driving out demons by the prince of demons. And then others ask for a sign from heaven. So here's Jesus. He's wandering around, um, teaching, healing people, caring for people, uh, the disciples are in people's homes, and exorcisms are part of that. And for us, that, that's kind of weird, right? Uh, I, I don't know, have you ever been to the circus? If you go to a modern circus, you know there's um, clowns and there's a trapeze act uh, and there might be somebody riding on a horse, you know, standing and jumping and... and that's not dissimilar from a circus you might have seen, say, 100 or 200 years ago. Except a couple of hundred years ago, circuses had a kind of a, what we might call a, a freak show. 
these weird, strange people and other people would, would go and stare at them. Uh, and, and we look at those images, those photos, and we kind of think, oh, that's weird. Uh, a, a, an old circus is like that, but a modern circus, you know, we're, we, we, we're different. Um, we we, we kind of know better than that. that. That just disrespects some people. And so I think we read these exorcisms, these demonic stories a bit like that, right? Ah, oh, discipleship is kind of like what it's like in the New Testament. We have to care for people. We have to bind up the brokenhearted. We have to explain how Jesus comes and brings life. And we have to talk about forgiveness. And, and then we read these exorcism stories and we kind of go, no, that's different. That's weird. Discipleship isn't like that anymore. I think they're kind of our default assumptions. So Jesus is out and somebody is mute and blind and our inclination would be to think, well, there's something wrong with their retina. That's why they're blind. There's something wrong with their mouth or their tongue or their vocal cords or um, perhaps they can't hear so they've never learned to speak or, um, and, and that's why they're mute. But the explanation we get in today's text is, no, this person was possessed. There's spiritual oppression that means that this person is mute and blind and bringing the kingdom actually is to exorcise that demon and immediately the person speaks. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? This is not just some detour down the weird, freaky sideshow. Uh, as we see Jesus and his disciples, um, the spiritual and the natural world just kind of intermix, right? So all along, Jesus has been talking about, uh, I'm not just seeing you guys going out in mission, I'm actually seeing Satan falling. Um, Jesus, and not just Jesus, other people have been exorcising demons. Um, Jesus is praying that the kingdom will come. Um, he's praying against spiritual temptation. We tend to, I think, have a view of the world where heaven, the spiritual dimension, is, is other. It's kind of up there, it's separate. But we live in this physical, natural domain that we kind of understand. And so we have physical, natural ex explanations for blindness or deafness or muteness or whatever it might be. You don't go to the doctor and expect your doctor to say, well, this person is possessed. Um, we expect a different type of explanation. And so I think we bring these assumptions when we come to the biblical text. Whereas what we're seeing here is, no, the, the two are kind of fused. There's an overlap or an intersection of the two. And so uh, when Jesus sees a physical, natural child, um, he talks about being like a child. But, but when children are possessed, they're exercised. Um, Jesus says, you know, don't focus on burying the dead, but actually proclaiming the kingdom. Um, we see sheep before wolves. Jesus sees Satan falling. Um, we skip this story, but, but Matthew, uh, sorry, um, Martha thinks that ministry is all about hospitality. But Jesus says, actually, it's Mary who got it right by stopping and listening to me. Um, and we've just had this story about the mute and the blind who's actually possessed. So I want to push back and say this split view of heaven and earth, the spiritual and the natural, the imminent and the transcendent, if you like. It's not the most helpful way to view the world, and it's not what we see going on in the New Testament. What we see is Jesus and his disciples uh, bring the spiritual dimension, and they bring little kingdom moments where the messiness and the brokenness and the rebellion of sin is dealt with. And somehow the kingdom of coming overcomes the brokenness and the uh, oppression and rebellion of this sinful world. And now Jesus is going to give us, and I think we need to listen, right, because uh, we're not in tune with this stuff. He's going to give us some teaching on 
spirituality as it relates to being a disciple on mission to somebody who goes. Jesus knew what the people were thinking. Uh, and he said, because they're thinking, oh, he drives out the demons by Beelzebub. Any kingdom divided its, against itself will be ruined and a house divided against itself will fall. In fact, Jesus says, I've been driving out demons by the finger of God and the kingdom of God is here. So let's just get our head into this space. Here's uh, someone possessed, they're mute, they're blind. Jesus just says something and they're healed. That's kind of amazing, right? That is uh, the clearest expression of the kingdom coming. That, that is proof that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the Messiah. And you would think everybody would just go, wow, that, that, that's unbelievable. Uh, God is here in the flesh. The Messiah has come. But no, that's not what people do. People come up with these weird explanations like, well, actually, this must be somehow one of Satan's demons driving out other demons. And Jesus counters with a logical argument. That makes no sense. That, that you know, a house divided against itself falls. And I think what we're meant to get here is that even though there is clear evidence that the kingdom has come, that Jesus' spiritual domain is stronger, People come up with weird explanations. And some people even ask for other signs. <coughs> I'm reading this book, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. And the subtitle is, Why New Atheism Grew Old and Secular Thinkers Are Considering Christianity Again. New Atheism. Do you remember that? Remember the bus um, campaign, there's probably no God, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. In about 2010, New Atheism was in its heyday and we were all kind of concerned as Christians, we felt under attack and that whole movement has kind of disappeared. It's gone nowhere. And as the book I'm reading suggests, I think there's a growing belief in God again but it's a particular type of God. And I think the new slogan you could put on the side of the bus might be, there probably is a God, so stop worrying and enjoy your life. I, I think we now believe in some sort of a, a vague spirit who somehow is out there but doesn't come into our world unless we happen to ask him to come and fix our problems. But we have a God who, ironically, is mute. He can't speak. Somehow, God's got nothing to say about morality, about right and wrong, about what we should and shouldn't do in our lives. And we just think it's completely up to us. We're the experts on us. Except God can somehow lean in and bless us when we ask him. Uh, and this God can't see what we're doing and he can't judge us. And that's all a crazy explanation. That's the 21st century version of us saying Satan's driving out Satan. We want a God who isn't God. We want a God who isn't strong, who isn't powerful, who isn't loving, who isn't um, just, uh, who can't pronounce judgments. We just want a God who somehow blesses us. And so perhaps we're no different. Perhaps that's how we counter the spiritual domain. Jesus tells uh, a little more. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and he divides up his plunder. So what Jesus is doing here is explaining what's just happened. Satan or his demon, is the strong man who has reign, who has authority over this possessed person's life. And so they can't speak and they can't see. He's a strong man. He does what he likes. But Jesus is the one who is stronger 
and casts out the strong man. And then we get a little bit more important information. Jesus is stronger and can plunder. The impact, the consequence of Jesus coming and casting out the demon is that he plunders that which was Satan's. And so Jesus brings not death and decay, but life and hope. And so one of the consequences of Jesus coming and reigning is that the, uh, the forces of darkness, the, um, the addictions or the lies um, or um, the sins that tempt us and hold on to us and, and destroy us, that those binds are broken as Jesus comes and he plunders that which Satan was holding on to as his stronghold and he frees it and brings life. And then Jesus says this, whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. It's very binary, isn't it? So somehow there's a spiritual battle happening here and the strong man has dominion and Jesus who is stronger come and comes and frees somebody and, and they can speak and they can see again and they can participate in relationships and family. They can find joy and meaning and purpose again. Um, and Jesus says, somehow we're caught up in this battle and either you're a gatherer of people, you're bringing people in as sheep into the pen, into the fold, they're protected, they're safe, they're blessed, they're nurtured, they're cared for, or you're scattering the sheep and they're exposed and they're in danger. You're gathering or you're scattering. There's no... Actually, I'm sitting on the sidelines and I'm watching. That, that's not an option. If you're not a gatherer, you're a scatterer. If you're not a gatherer, then you're opposed to Jesus and the coming of his kingdom. And we're gathering, or as he said earlier in this series, we're harvesting. This is a call to harvest, not just for the 12, but for everyone. And then we get a little bit more teaching. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places like the desert, seeking rest and it doesn't find it. And then it says, I will return to the house that I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than it was at first. I find this a fascinating story. So here you've got a guy who somehow is suffering as a result of some level of oppression and somehow that demon is cast out. This guy tidies up his house, gets his life in order. How? We don't know. Is it Jesus? Uh, can he do it himself? Uh, remember that in Luke's gospel, there are other people who are casting out demons. It seems like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law have the capacity to cast out demons because Jesus said, remember, um, if I'm casting out demons and I'm doing it by Beelzebub, then who are you doing it by? So we're not quite sure who or how, but somebody seems to have uh, a demon exercised and they get their house in order and they're kind of enjoying the freedom and the benefits but they don't invite Jesus to be their king. And this demon wanders around and then comes back and brings seven friends and makes things worse than what they were before. The only way you can be safe is to have Jesus as your king, as resident on the throne in your heart. And if you don't, the risk is that Satan or a demon will return with some worse friends 
and your life will be worse than what it was before you tried to tidy up your own house. So let's have some practical application. What does all of this mean for us as disciples? Here's my first question for you. Do you expect spiritual opposition? If you are out trying to bring the kingdom to bear in little parts of this broken world, then Satan will oppose you. Uh, you're participating in an internal spiritual battle that, that is bigger than us, uh, where Satan is not just our opponent, but actually he's, he's a powerful figure. He, he has some capacity to uh, have authority and influence. D do you expect that as you live life and try and follow Jesus as a disciple of his? I think at times we expect that when we're disciples, Jesus is supposed to bless us. You know, Jesus, I've been reading my Bible. I've been trying to be godly. I've been going to Bible study. I've been involved in ministry. How come things are going wrong in my life? Well, of course they're going wrong in your life. You're involved in a spiritual battle and Satan opposes the coming of the kingdom. Do you expect spiritual opposition or are you somehow disappointed or even worse uh, do you somehow lose your mojo and start to blame people other people uh, and, and cause division inside the church when you encounter spiritual opposition we ought to expect spiritual opposition we ought not be undone or demotivated or divided when it comes but it ought to cause us to enthrone jesus more and more Secondly, do you hope that Jesus is somebody who conforms to your views? It's a little bit like what I was saying about the bus, right? I, I think the world wants a God who is somehow a nice guy, but hands off, doesn't tell us what to do, doesn't see what we do, doesn't judge us, but just comes and fixes up things when they're not quite how we want them to be. Is that a picture of God that we've somehow imbibed a little bit from our world? Remember, Jesus says, when you go out on mission, you can't look back. It's going to be like work putting your hand to the plow. We're going to feel overwhelmed and without the resources we need and without enough people. And so we're going to have to be prayerfully dependent, pray against temptation. And so discipleship will be a challenge. Third, are you gathering or are you scattering? And I want to speak to a few of you whose inclination might be, I'm not quite sure. I think I'm, I'm listening. I come to church. I'm giving a bit of my income. I say my devotions and praying. Am I gathering really? There aren't spectators in the kingdom. You're a gatherer or you're a scatterer. Which one of those are you? And I think that really comes back to our fourth question I want to ask you. Who is enthroned in your heart. Let's go back to the guy who somehow the demon is exorcised and he tidies up his own house. He doesn't make Jesus Lord. I can see why he might have done that. We often don't want the negative effects of sin and judgment and brokenness in our life. And we're glad to have Jesus come and fix that up and deal with that. And we're glad that Jesus is stronger than Satan so that on the day of judgment, we will be counted amongst the sheep, amongst the righteous. But actually, when it comes to the here and the now, we're kind of happy to be forgiven and have sin dealt with, but we're not sure we want Jesus as Lord and we want to be a disciple who follows his every footstep. And that means 
being a disciple with our time, with our resources, having a kingdom focus, serving other people, even the people who despise us, like the Jews despise the Samaritans. I think we, we kind of like the benefits of having Satan cast out, but we're not sure we want to put Jesus on the throne. And so we kind of half sit on there ourselves and try and reap part of the benefits. And that's a precarious place to be. Because that wandering exorcised demon might come back with seven worse friends and your life will be worse than what it was before. And so my challenge at the culmination of this series is, is Jesus Lord of your life? There are some challenges to being a disciple of Jesus. I don't want to deny that. There is a cost to taking up your cross and following Jesus. But there is a security and an assurance. There is a joy and a purpose that you are part of the coming of the kingdom in this life and into the next in ways that secure you against the work of the evil one. You can't do that in your own strength. You can only do that by having Jesus as the Lord of your life. Amen.